And next up, see, I, sh I shouldn't have let, is <laughs> the structured reporting talk I mentioned. Um, so structured reports, Christopher Walker, uh, University of Kansas. Hello, my name is Chris Walker, and I'm a cardiothoracic radiologist at the University of Kansas Medical Center in Kansas City, Kansas. Today, I'll be talking with you about structured reporting. I have a few disclosures that are not relevant to the content of this presentation, including book royalties from Amherst and Elsevier, as well as being a member of the Speakers Bureau for Beringer Ingelheim Pharmaceuticals. I wanted to specifically acknowledge Dr. Jonathan Chung from the University of Chicago, who was instrumental in helping me put together this presentation. Much of the research material and ideas for this presentation were developed by him and his colleagues at the University of Chicago. At the end of this presentation, I hope that you'll remember the following. Structured reports are preferred by both clinicians and patients. Disease-specific templates aid in quality improvement and remind you to include important ancillary findings in your dictations. And finally, structured reports encourage positive radiologist behavior. Before we talk about the benefits of structured reports, I wanted to review the different types of radiology reports you will see in practice. Most radiology reports may be broken up into three different types, individual templates or prose, structured reporting, or a combination of structured reporting and prose. This is an example of a chest radiograph finding section using prose as a reporting style. Prose is loosely grouped information, often based on the radiologist's search pattern. In a large group of radiologists, you often have considerable variation in the reports and reporting style. The information presented in the report is often presented differently or omitted entirely depending on the radiologist reading the study. For example, in this report, you can see that all structures are common and on, including the right internal jugular central venous catheter, the lungs and pleura, the mediastinum and heart, and the osseous structures. If we look at this prose report on the same case, the information is similar, but presented in a different order. Also note this radiologist did not talk about the osseous structures. In this last example, we can see that this radiologist decided to combine the findings and impression into one section and simply stated negative chest. Hopefully everyone can appreciate if a clinician is looking at this, it may make it difficult or take more time to find what they are interested in, be it the lungs or pleura or potentially the mediastinum. Let's contrast that form of reporting with a structured report. This is a structured report from the same case. You can see that each section, including the support devices, lungs and pleura, heart and mediastinum, and osseous structures have their own heading. This is also standardized across radiologists in the group. Structured reporting is particularly helpful for a junior radiologist by establishing a search pattern. We have to remember that we are ultimately creating these reports for our referring clinicians and our patients. So what has been done to determine which reporting style is preferred by these two different groups? This was a large study that looked at reporting styles from the patient perspective. Over 5,000 patients reviewed two identical chest radiograph reports. One presented in prose and the other was structured reporting. They found that structured reporting was easier to comprehend by the patients and the patient felt less likely to take unnecessary action in the event of a negative report. There have been several studies looking at how clinicians perceive different radiology reporting styles. This study was performed at a large academic center in Ohio. The study divided clinicians into three different groups. The novice group consisted of medical students and interns. The intermediate group consisted of PGY2 through PGY4 residents, as well as all mid-levels or advanced practice providers. And the advanced group consisted of PGY5 residents and above, as well as all attendings. Each participant in the study reviewed two radiology reports containing identical information. The one on the left utilized structured reporting and the report on the right utilized prose or paragraph style. You can see that the information in both reports is identical. The only difference is that the structured report contains section headers, such as the mediastinum and bone section. Importantly, the impression is also the same between the two reporting styles. 
They first assessed which reporting style was easier to read by the clinician. You can see that the structured report had better readability or the same readability when compared to prose or paragraph style reporting. Next, they assessed the clinical utility of the structured report compared to prose reporting. And again, the structured report was perceived as equal or better in the vast majority of cases. Also note that the results were very similar when looking at the different groups of clinicians involved in the study, ranging from a medical student all the way to an attending. Next, I want to discuss disease-specific reporting. With disease-specific reporting, you tailor your structured report to the condition you are reading to ensure completeness of the report. This is especially helpful as it reminds the radiologist to discuss important findings and information pertaining to that disease process that may have been forgotten during a busy day, such as including the presence of right heart strain in the setting of pulmonary embolism. Disease-specific reporting may also be used in a wide variety of cases, ranging from lung cancer screening or CTAs uh, performed for suspected pulmonary embolism or acute aortic syndrome. I want to go over an example that has recently helped me in clinical practice. This is a photo of the Watchman device. The Watchman device is a left atrial appendage occluder device used to help prevent cardioembolic strokes in patients with atrial fibrillation who cannot receive anticoagulation. In patients with atrial fibrillation, one of the feared complications is thrombus forming within the left atrial appendage. To prevent thrombus from causing a stroke, interventional cardiology places the device into the appendage. In the past, transesophageal echocardiogram was primary, primarily used to help plan the procedure by determining what size of the device was needed and where the landing spot of the watching device should be. However, over the last few years, there has been increasing literature showing that pre-procedural planning CT may actually reduce the time needed to perform the procedure as well as reduce the rate of complications such as peri-device leak. So increasingly, interventional cardiologists have been ordering a CTA prior to the procedure to help with planning. Unfortunately, there are numerous things that you should ideally include in a pre-procedural planning CT for placing the Watchman device ranging from the morphology of the appendage to the left atrial appendage osteal diameter, the landing zone diameter, and the length of the appendage from the mid landing zone. I personally was having trouble remembering everything I should include. So I decided to create a structured template using a pick list to ensure that all the information was included. This created some work up front, but it saved me time in the end as each report is easier to produce. This has also helped trainees that rotate through cardiac imaging as it reminds them what is important to include in the report. Another way that disease specific structure reporting is helpful is shown by a study that was performed at the University of Chicago by Jonathan Chung and colleagues looking at pulmonary embolism reporting. In the past, they reported pulmonary embolism studies using a standard chest CT structured template. Notice how there is no specific section relating to pulmonary embolism. So it was up to the radiologist to describe the embolism in ancillary features such as the presence of right heart strain. They then created a new disease specific template, which is quite similar to the original template, except for the portion after the impression, which contains the findings that they wanted to ensure were discussed in all pulmonary embolism CT reports ranging from whether it was positive, negative, or indeterminate, as well as the presence of right ventricular strain. As you can see, there was a substantial and statistically significant increase in the completeness of CT pulmonary embolism reports after inception of their PE-specific CT template, from a baseline of 69% to an immediate post-intervention rate of 92%. Something else that the PE-specific structure template allowed them to do was to track the PE-specific data longitudinally from month to month in an IT-based tool they call the PE tracker. One of the variables they tracked was the indeterminate rate of CTPE studies, that is studies that are technically inadequate for PE evaluation. Their rate typically oscillated between one and 3% every month. However, they noticed in monthly analysis of the PE data using the PE tracker, a consistent uptick in the indeterminate rate to around 4 to 6%, which was about a standard deviation above the mean. 
Due to this change in their non-diagnostic rate, they implemented a PowerPoint-based educational program for their CT techs and also standardized their CT protocols across their health system with subsequent improvement in their non-diagnostic rate back to a more acceptable 2 to 3%. So by ensuring that each CTPE exam had a discussion on the quality of the exam, by using structured reporting, they were able to quickly detect a change and implement an improvement. If they had been using a pro style report, this information would not have been available to them. Structured reporting can also be used to positively and quickly change radiologist behavior. Did you know that in the landmark National Lung Screening Trial, there were more deaths due to cardiovascular disease than from lung cancers? It makes sense as the same populations that are at risk for lung cancer are at risk for cardiac and vascular disease. In the second study from Jonathan Chung and colleagues from the University of Chicago, they realized that reporting of the degree of coronary calcium was suboptimal across the body and chest divisions. Because of the growing literature showing that non-gated chest CT is strongly associated with EKG-gated calcium scoring, and that this can identify patients at risk for coronary and vascular disease, the chest and body sections agreed to qualitatively report coronary calcium on all chest CT scans performed in the department. They created a set of standard reference images in a new field in the chest CT templates, which is highlighted here. Use of the new template was mandated instead of individual templates. And these discussions were disseminated initially mainly using email. Prior to the new template creation, compliance with coronary artery calcium reporting was 70% in the chest section and only 36% in the abdominal section. Following the new template, the chest section was 99% compliant, while the abdominal imaging section was 78% compliant. Both sections had markedly improved, but there was room for improvement in the abdominal section. So what was going on with the abdominal section after the first intervention? Well, they found that about 50% of the time, coronary artery calcium reporting was missing due to the residents' use of their own individual template. The remainder of the time, a coronary artery calcium section was not in the attending's individual template. They then decided to meet with the abdominal imaging section in person to review the results and let them know why reporting coronary artery calcium was extremely important for risk stratifying patients for cardiovascular events. Individual template use was discouraged and resident templates were discarded. After waiting a month, data was collected again. The information in the March 2016 column showed that compliance further increased following the second intervention, 100% in the chest section and 93% in the abdominal imaging section. So in summary, structure reports are preferred by clinicians and patients. Disease specific templates can aid in quality improvement and also help remind the radiologist to include all ancillary features in their dictation. And finally, the use of structure reports can encourage positive radiologist behavior and can quickly alter a radiologist reporting, as, as was shown in the coronary artery calcium example. If anyone has questions regarding structure reporting or wanted to talk about thoracic imaging as a career choice, please feel free to reach out to me at my email listed here. Thank you.